Your book starts off with a discussion of three really important uh, figures in the history of learning, uh, John Watson, B.F. Skinner, and Neil Miller. And uh, I want to make a few comments on them and clarify a few points because they're important in uh, uh, providing us a theoretical context um, in interpreting behavior and learning. Um, the, there's a, a really historically uh, important figure, a fourth important figure, uh, Ivan Pavlov, but we're going to spend a couple of weeks on him. So, uh, so this is a story of a bunch of old guys, but hopefully it gives us a little historical context of why we're talking about some of the issues that we're talking about in this class. So John Watson writes at a really important piece in 1913 called Psychology as a Behaviorist Views It. Um, and in that, he claims that psychology needs to be a purely objective branch of natural science. Um, he focuses on prediction and control of behavior, and he applies uh, these principles to both man and animal, um, animal behavior that is, or non-human animal behavior. He's heavily in influenced by Pavlov, and the emphasis is on Pavlovian conditioning, or maybe what we're going to call later, we're going to call this respondent conditioning because we're going to include a lot of other things in, in that category, um, is sometimes also called classical conditioning. Uh, Watson does some really famous uh, experiments. What The most famous experiment he does is the conditioning of fear in, in a little boy named Little Albert. That's what this picture is right here, is this little, uh, little kid named Little Albert. Um, and then this is uh, Watson's assistant. This is Watson himself. Um, and they, uh, they scare the crap out of Little Albert. Um, essentially. Um, and uh, so it, it's focused on what we call the putting together or the pairing or the contiguity of particular events is what Watson thinks is important in conditioning. So in the little Albert experiment, uh, he presents a furry animal and then he um, startles little Albert with a, a loud noise. Um, he bangs a, a rod behind him and scares little Albert and startles little Albert and then through repeated pairings uh, it comes to be that little Albert is afraid of anything with sort of white fur or fur on it. Um, so for it was important for Watson um, uh, to consider uh, the going together, the pairing, of putting two, two things together um, that was uh, important for shaping and changing behavior and that's how we learn is by um, the, the, the word association comes in here, the association of two things, that white things go with loud noises for little Albert. Um, now Watson uh, is important because he rejects mental events or introspection uh, in psychology. That's what he basically lays out in the psychology as a behaviorist to use it. Um, he later goes on, he's a controversial figure because he later goes on, he, he, he winds up leaving Johns Hopkins, um, maybe has an extramarital affair and blah, 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 all this stuff, right? Uh, but what he goes on to do is he goes on to be an advertising executive and he applies the principles that he's learned from Little Albert to marketing and that is that he starts putting together attractive women in soap. You know, if you want to sell soap, put them together with really attractive movie stars of the day. Marlene Dietrich is, you know, the, the, the mark, you know, is a, a movie star in the 30s, 40s, 50s. So if you put these things together, you're going to, you're going to like the, um, the soap more because it goes with this really attractive movie star. And if you use this soap, you might be as beautiful as her. That was the, at least the, the notion behind it. He's a successful uh, advertising agent uh, um, executive in Baltimore. Uh, after leaving Hopkins, um, and that's Watson's story. Now, B.F. Skinner is um, uh, takes sort of things one step further. His major uh, contributions uh, begin with the publication of a book called *The Behavior of Organisms* in 1938, and then *Science and Human Behavior* in 1953, and then *Verbal Behavior* in 1957, and a bunch of other stuff. He publishes something like 15 or 16 books and hundreds of articles. Um, and what he does is that he, t he takes this whole issue of um, uh, behavior to uh, a, a, new sort of, uh, a new sort of place. Um, and what he argues is that the proper subject of psychology is behavior, is what we see people do. 
He's influenced by Pavlov, but his emphasis is on operant conditioning, not Pavlovian conditioning or responding conditioning, but on operant conditioning. And he views mental internal events as not, they're not causes of behavior, but are behavior in and of themselves and necessary for study. So Skinner did a lot of work with pigeons. Uh, pigeons were uh, a convenient uh, uh, sort of species to work with. He um, actually, his, some of his first experiments with, with pigeons were conducted in Minneapolis in the Twin Cities uh, on top of the gold medal flower company uh, building where the pigeons would hang out and eat it leftover grain from the, from the, from the mills. Um, he applied the principles that he discovered to human behavior. This is a picture of his daughter Debbie and his wife in what he called the baby tender. He built a box in which um, children could, uh, it was like, a, he called it an air crib. Um, he was um, thoroughly uh, eviscerated and abused and, and criticized for this uh, picture and, and the air crib because he thought um, people thought that he was uh, treating children like he was treating his pigeons. He was just putting them in boxes. But it turns out there's all these rumors about Debbie um, going crazy and committing suicide and blah, 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 blah. And she's uh, still alive. She lives in London. Um, she is, from all accounts, everybody has said, a lovely individual. She's actually written a response to some of these criticisms and so on. Uh, Skinner also, in the 1950s, began tinkering and toying with what he called teaching machines, and this is a version of the teaching machine, and it was a fully mechanical device to uh, help uh, kids learn things and uh, teach things, um, and it really predates the computer. He also, uh, believe it or not, uh, invented and was involved heavily in training uh, pigeons to guide missiles in World War II. This is one of the applications of, of some of his research. Neil Miller um, is a little bit later in, uh, in, the, um, in the story and what he did was integrate behaviorally, uh, uh, behavioral and personality-based psychology. He was critical in inventing biofeedback. He was actually, this is a picture of some of the rat work that he did in which um, rats were trained to control certain physiological events. Um, and biofeedback has been a critically important uh, uh, intervention for people with all sorts of things, from migraine headaches to, um, uh, uh, you know, all, all, all sorts of different things. He thought a more thorough analysis of brain function was necessary, and certainly that, that, is, that is. So, um, when we talk about what, what has changed from Watson to Skinner, uh, Watson thought that internal events cannot be used as data in psychology, where Skinner thought that uh, in, internal events could not be used in theories of psychology. We don't want to explain behavior by appealing to internal events, but these could be data. Well, what Skinner said was that he granted internal events no special causal status. Okay, so if you um, if, if a child hits a teacher and you say it's because he's angry, then uh, that would be appealing to an internal event called anger that has no special causal status in, uh, in Skinner's psychology. He wanted to know. Uh, he didn't think that that really provided any advantage uh, because you still had to explain the anger. So uh, in a technical sense, um, in an academic sense, theories appealing to internal events rely on, we, we think in most cases, intervening variables or hypothetical constructs. And intervening variables are unobserved phenomena or processes or states, and they connect to or more observed variables or observed processes or states or activities. And we often think that they explain one of the states or activities or processes. Like we explain a student's aggression or a student's hitting, hitting a teacher because of their anger, but we still don't understand the anger. So it doesn't really do, a, uh, do us any service in explaining that feature. It turns out that kids hit teachers uh, or kids hit each other for a variety of different reasons, not just because they're angry. Um, it, it, it's a, a more thorough assessment uh, is, is needed. Moving from Skinner to Miller, Skinner rejected intervening variables, um, but Miller thought that they were useful in predicting behavior. And uh, if, if, so if, if in fact you say to somebody, somebody's a narcissist, 
which is a uh, description of you could say of a person's behavior. They uh, they tend to uh, think only about themselves. They're they're very interested in themselves. They're very interested in how they look. They think everything the world revolves around them. That's what we would call a narcissist. Uh, Miller thought Miller thought that that would be valuable because um, you know if you're going to date somebody and somebody told you he's a narcissist or she's a narcissist, that might be a valuable thing to to know. So. Um, the role of intervening variables in psychology is still controversial. I mean, I don't know which one it is. I think they're helpful to a certain extent, but I also think they add complexity rather than reducing it. That was Skinner's criticism, and they are likely circular and may point to issues that cannot be addressed. For example, circularity, uh, just to briefly touch on that is when you use the term you want to define in the definition or assuming some prior understanding of some part of the term. So for example, if we say a hill is a protrusion of land smaller than a mountain, and we define a mountain as a protrusion of land larger than a hill, how do we know what either one of these are? Um, there's, there's circular definitions. Likewise, in, in psychology, we may uh, think of the, the uh, concept of, uh, of intelligence as an intervening variable. We might say, why did she do that? And we say, because she's intelligent. But if you probe further and ask, how do you know he's intelligent or she's intelligent? And if the conclusion is because she does things like that, then we have a circular uh, concept. Likewise, um, Skinner uh, talked at length about thirst. Why is he drinking so much? Well, because he's thirsty, dummy, of course. That's why he's drinking so much. Like this picture of the dog, the dog, we've seen dogs, you know, probably are videos of dogs uh, drinking a lot. Well, how do you know that he's thirsty? Well, because I can see him drinking. But the, the drinking is what we're trying to explain, we're trying to understand. And there are cases of people that drink a lot that aren't thirsty. This is uh, Kobayashi, who is a, uh, a competitive eater doing the one gallon milk challenge. Uh, people drink a lot for reasons other than thirst. So thirst is, uh, adds a level of complexity that we might not want in, in our understanding. Sociability, why is that guy so sociable? Because he's an extrovert. That sounds like an explanation, but if you press further, how do you know that he's an extrovert? Well, can't you see how sociable he is? Uh, we, we're, we're, we're merely explaining the, the result with, with the cause. So paranoia is another one. Why is she completely suspicious of everybody's motive? Well, motives, because she's got paranoid dis personality disorder, of course. Well, how do you know that she's got paranoid personality disorder? By the fact that she's so suspicious of everybody's motives. So these are circular concepts that probably lend more complexity than they need to. Why did the defendant do what he did? Because he's insane. How do you know he's insane? Because only an insane person would do that. That's a circular concept, an intervening variable or hypothetical construct that uh, are, are trouble. So I would like to suggest that we try to avoid these at all costs.